Now, I want to welcome those who are joining us online. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm, I'm Pastor Ross Gilbert. I'm the lead pastor here, and I'm, I'm excited for this morning because of the, the message. Uh, there's, there's an idea, there's a phrase out there or a saying out there, uh, at times life is hard, and the rest of the time it's just brutal. That's an over, overstatement, obviously. It's not entirely true, of course. But um, because there are times where it's good and, and things are, are lighter and easier, and, and we celebrate those moments. But I, I wonder if we celebrate those moments because they're rare at times, because there are seasons in our life that aren't uh, as simple. They're not as easy. Um, Solomon, in, in his book of Ecclesiastes, the famous passage, chapter 3, uh, talked about how there's an appointed time for everything. There's a time for every event under heaven, a time to give birth, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to uproot what is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to shun embracing, a time to search and a time to give up a loss, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear apart and a time to sew together, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. It's a season for everything, and, and life consists of, of good and easy times as well as hard and difficult times. And, and while that may not always happen in the, the same proportions that we would prefer, there is, for all of us, seasons of hardship, seasons of difficulties. But because there is a purpose in those hardships, a purpose in those things, it's good that we endure them. Whether they be physical struggles, maybe they'll be uh, health issues, or, or maybe just as you get older and just age kicks in and you start to, your body starts to wear down. Maybe there's emotional issues where you're struggling through seasons of depression, seasons of anxiety, or relationship issues. Or maybe even spiritual issues in the sense that you feel, keyword feel, far from God. You feel like, like God is distant from you or he's not answering your prayers or maybe even having times of doubt with God. We all face these struggles. But knowing that we all face these struggles doesn't immediately make them easy. It doesn't immediately uh, t take away how hard and difficult they are. And pain, and I think especially pain that endures over a long time, Sometimes that low-grade, dull pain that just, just is there all the time is worse than the big punch, the big sharp pains. Because what that does is just eats away at our soul, eating away at our faith, or can at times at least. And I think that's what makes this passage that we're about to study this morning so special, so powerful, so incredible, so helpful for us, especially if you're enduring a difficult season right now. Because what it does, is it points us back to the bigger picture. It points us back to where our hope is. It points us back to the fact that there is always a purpose of what we're enduring. And so we're going we're gonna to read this passage together um, and, and then break it down into smaller parts so hopefully we can have a deeper understanding of it. But beginning in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, Paul writes, For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earth and vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death works in us, but life in you. Let's pray. Father, we've come again to another one of your passages that is, is just riddled with hope in the midst of adversity. A passage that speaks of life in the midst of death. A passage that I hope will encourage each and every one of us who are in that season right now. And that's something that will remind us for the next time we're in those seasons. And so, Holy Spirit, Comforter, would you come now and speak? Would you be the teacher through me to each person listening right now? 
And may they hear your words of encouragement, your words of hope, your words of, of comfort. Not to in any way diminish what we're going through, but provide the hope and the sustenance to get through it, the perseverance that we need. In your name we pray, amen. Well, whenever, whenever you're studying the scriptures, it's really important to keep the larger context in mind. Uh, the context will always help you understand the meaning of a passage uh, and keep you from going down the wrong path and misapplying it. Uh, every, every cult, every uh, uh, bad teaching would be able to point to a scripture, but what they've done is they've taken that scripture and they've twisted it and they've made it mean something that it doesn't. So the context helps protect you against that. For example, the phrase, I need to put her down, means two very different things depending on the context. If you're talking about a terminally ill dog, that's very different than a parent talking about a little baby. At least I hope it would be different, right? And so the outcomes, you don't want to mix up on those things, right? Uh, I had a thought about grandma in there, but I wasn't sure I didn't want to go down that route. So, uh, so the context in that conversation will let you know which, what that phrase is really meaning by it. And so I mention all this because right now in this passage, Paul's very much in the middle of a conversation. He's in the middle of this, this uh, great passage that he's writing to the, the original readers of this letter, which is his dear, beloved friends in the city of Corinth. And, and the passage that we're about to study really is a, a deeper commentary of the one we studied last week, the first five verses of this chapter. But I want to kind of set the context, set the table to a really, really brief recap of some of the highlights that brought us up to this point, right? So what Paul's doing is he's explaining to the Corinthians why things have unfolded the way they have, right? There was, they went through a rough patch relationally, and so he's trying to repair that by sharing his heart with them, sharing his motivation with them, and why he's doing the things he's doing. And to do that, what he's doing is describing what a new covenant minister is. And remember, who are the new covenant ministers? Is it just the pastors? Is it the evangelists? Is it the teachers? Who are the new covenant ministers? We all are, right? So he's describing what that looks like. And he's been describing what that means and how that's carried out. And, and the role that we have as new covenant ministers, he says, we are not adequate in ourselves. That is a good word. That is a good word. Who is adequate for such a beautiful mission to share the grace and the glory of God? None of us are. And so he says, we're not adequate in ourselves, but God himself has made us adequate as ministers of the new covenant. And so in this role, as these ministers, what we do is we preach Jesus, not, not a historical Jesus, right? It's not about this, this man that lived 2,000 years ago and he lived a great life, follow that man's teachings, but a living Jesus, someone who is alive today, someone that the grave could not hold, someone who's free and living in us now. And we're preaching a Jesus, the trust in that Jesus that now lives in you and me. And so Paul, he says he's doing this. He's preaching this. He's, he's given his life over this. And he said earlier in the passage, in the chapter, what motivates him is because he was loved. Because this great mercy was bestowed on him, that sustains him and that motivates him to love others. Because he was first loved, he now loves others. And so he goes on to say that this motivation is so deep that he's actually become the bond slave of the Corinthians that he's serving them now in the hopes with the purpose so that God will be glorified in Paul, but also that God will be glorified in the Corinthians. That's the context here. Keep that in mind because he's going to explain all this in greater detail for the rest of the chapter, and I think it will make sense then as we go through it. So in verse 6, he says, For God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shone in our hearts to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Now, the commentators debated on whether this quote here, the, light, the, the one who said, light shall shine out of darkness, the, there's the debate. Was it in Genesis 1-3 or was it Isaiah 9? Which passage was Paul quoting here? Genesis 1-3 is that famous passage of in the beginning, God said, let there be light. And when we went through Genesis 1-4, to we talked about how that light wasn't the sun, moon, and stars. That shows up three days later on day four. But on day one, when he said, let there be light, that was the light of the world. That's Jesus. But other commentators say it's Isaiah 9. Everyone knows Isaiah 9. You're all familiar with that, right? Off the top of your head? <laughs> you actually are. You just don't know it. A very famous verse, Isaiah 9, verse 6, says, for a child will be born to us. 
A son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Now, I realize I'm about three months reading that verse too early. That's normally one you read at Christmas time, but that's Isaiah 9. It's a, it's a beautiful prophecy of the coming of Jesus. But if we back up a couple verses into verse 2, Isaiah writes this. He says, the people who walk in darkness. Now, he's, he's specific here. He's talking about the non-Jews. He's talking about the Gentiles. So in Isaiah 9, it's this, he's presenting the gospel, but beyond Israel, to the whole world. So when it says the people who walk in darkness is referring to the Gentiles, who will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. So I, I believe that it's Isaiah 9 that he's talking about because Paul's writing to a Gentile, predominantly Gentile church. And now the light of Jesus has gone to them, not just the Jews. Now the bottom line is, if it's Isaiah 9 or, or, or Genesis 1, doesn't really matter because who is the light? It's Jesus. That's the main point that he's trying to talk about here is that God has shone his light, his light being Jesus Christ himself, into our hearts that we may know the glory of God in the face of Jesus, that we may know God's glory and who he is by seeing him. Remember Hebrews 1.3, that God is the exact representation of God the Father. Jesus speaking to his disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because it was the Father living in Jesus, and they're the same essence. And so we're getting to know who God is and his glory through the person of Jesus. Remember, that's what this is all about, the motivation to see God glorified in these Corinthian believers. Now, what's interesting is, is this idea, then, of, of light showing up in darkness. Because the, the best way to highlight something is to contrast it with something that is very the opposite of that. For example, good music versus country music, right? It's very easy then for the country music to stand out in that way, right? Let me give you another illustration, though. It was almost 20 years ago, and a couple months will be 20 years ago, where I went and I bought the engagement ring that Joy has on her finger. And I remember walking into the store, and, and you walk in there, and they've got all these spotlights on top, right? I mean, I can't imagine what their electrical bill was before LEDs, but you just walk in, you felt a tan forming. And, and so you get in there, and you start looking around, and, and you say, well, that, that ring looks interesting. And so he, he pulls out the ring. Guys, you, you can re relate to this, right? He pulls out the ring, and then what does he put underneath the ring? Black felt and the ring on top with these bright, bright lights shining down from above. Boy, that ring, that diamond sparkled. It was like four times the size right now. I want to take her back to the store and just show her how good her ring really is, right? <laughs> like, you had that, that big contrast of the light and the black felt. That made that ring pop, stand out. And that's what God's doing here, is this light in the midst of darkness is going to be, be popping. It's going to show. And so is there any bigger contrast than God and fallen man and sinful man? God's grace is highlighted in the fact that he's redeemed you and I, that he's he shone his light into the darkness of our hearts before we knew him. God redeemed the sinner because he didn't have to. He didn't owe it to us. No one deserves God's grace ever, and yet he chose to do so. The beautiful light of Jesus versus the darkness of man's fallen heart. The fact that God didn't wait for you and I to clean up our, our life, to clean up our act, but rather he rescued us while we were in that mess. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his love for us that while you were still sinners, while you, you were flawed and broken and not good enough, that's when Christ died for you. And so God's grace is, is not greater because of the darkness. It doesn't need it to be dark for it to be great. It's great on its own, but rather it shows up best in the darkness. Put it this way, if I have a flashlight and I go outside right now or at noon and I turn that flashlight on, it's bright, but it doesn't make much of a difference. But if, if I do it at night now, at midnight, the flashlight isn't any brighter, but now it shows up better. And that's with God's grace. God's grace shows up best in the midst of the darkness. It shows up best in the, in the sense of with fallen man. It, it's why we love the testimonies of people who seem so far from grace. Like, like the prodigal son 
And that story about how he, he just wasted everything, he abandoned everything, and yet when he came back, the father loved him and the father accepted him because God's grace was waiting for him. And for those people who don't like pineapple on pizza, I want you to know God's grace is waiting for you too. It's important to know that. Verse 7, verse 7, it says but, but really it's so. It's a continuation. It's, he's, he's applying the idea. So, because he's shone this light in the darkness of our hearts, so we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. Now, some of the commentators were looking at this word treasure, and they were saying, well, it's the ministry that Paul has. That's the treasure, this ministry that he's been given. And others said, well, no, it's, it's the gospel. It's the good news that he has. I don't think it's either. I think the treasure is a person, is Jesus Christ. That's what we've been given. And so Jesus himself, the Lord of lords, <clears throat> the king of kings, the majesty of majesties, the one who made all things from the beginning, the prince of peace, the wonderful counselor. Think about it. Greg, he's taken up permanent residence inside of you. Perfect God and little itty bitty you. That's incredible. This treasure. I love how one commentator puts it. He says, the astonishing thing is that such a divine treasure, God's own presence of grace, the ultimate of what is heavenly, absolute priceless, absolutely priceless, beyond the value of all rubies and diamonds of earth, should be placed in such miserable vessels and be kept in them so long. One would expect that this treasure would be entrusted only in vessels of the highest value, be placed where they and their treasure are only admired and are only ever handled with utmost care and reverence. But see what God has done. That God would put his life in each and every one of us as we put our faith in him. Don't, don't let that truth become so commonplace that you just skip over it. Don't ever lose the awe and the wonder that Christ is in you right now, Barry. That's such a powerful truth. And so this treasure, Jesus, now living in you and I as an earthen vessel, Let's, let's define this earthen vessel. The, the Greek word, I think, is ostra, ostrakis. And it's, it's used by archaeologists and so forth. It refers to anything that is, is made of clay. So clay pots or clay shards. And they often find these. If every archaeological dig, they'll find all these broken shards or broken pots. And it was, it was a very common thing, kind of like, like plates and cups and bowls in our own home. And what was interesting about these earthen vessels, these, these ostracus, was that they were disposable. That if, if one broke, it broke. They're cheap. You replace it, and off you went. They didn't cost very much. They were very simple. There was nothing special about them. And that's what you and I are compared to. Ordinary, give no second thought to pieces of clay. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> right? But that's, that's what he's comparing it to. And he says he's putting this light into these earthen vessels. So let's, let's think about that a little bit, right? Let's imagine we got a clay pot, an earthen vessel, and we put a light inside the clay pot. Is the light coming from the pot? No. It's coming from the light inside the pot. Because the pot itself cannot produce any light. All it does is contain the light. And right there, right off the bat, we got this beautiful picture. There are two big takeaways, simple takeaways, powerful takeaways. First, you don't need to be something ornate. You don't need to be something special to be used of God. You know, often, often we think it's got to be something beautiful and, and perfect, and everything's got to be just like, wow, stand out. And yet, sometimes it's the most common items that God uses. You think about it, if you have this beautiful vase or vase or, or pot, I don't know, whatever it is, right? If you have this beautiful um, you know, ornamental piece of, of glassware, it's often you know, put on, on, a, on a mantle and looked at, but never used. And then you have that simple bowl that every day is used over and over and over and over again. God doesn't need you to be something special. He just needs you to trust him so he could be special in you. The surpassing greatness would be of God and not of yourselves. And so that's the second thing that's so incredible here is the power which offers that love, which offers that strength and that wisdom and that kindness and that peace, everything you and I need in every given moment. <clears throat> that power doesn't come from you. 
any more than light comes from the pot. It's coming from the life of Jesus inside of you and I. It's Christ in you that does that. But let's go further in our picture, right? So we've got that clay pot, and we've got a, a light. Maybe it's a candle, and we put it in the middle of that pot, and we shut all the lights off in this room. How much light is coming out of that pot? Not much, really. Right? If it's like you think about those, those, uh, those brown earthen pots, clay pots, they're pretty thick walls. And so really all you get is a light that comes up and shines and makes a nice little spotlight on the ceiling, but the rest of the room is still dark. And so the danger now becomes that clay pot can actually inhibit the amount of light. So if I want to have more light released from that pot, what do I need to do? Put some holes in that pot. Right? Maybe take a bit of a hammer and start to put some cracks in it or, or chip away at it in order to get more light to, to come out. Now, if that pot could talk, what would it be saying? I don't like this plan. This isn't good. In fact, you're devaluing me now. In fact, now I'm, some, I'm, I'm broken and I'm cracked and, and I'm not good enough anymore. And yet, that's exactly what God, and that's what Paul is talking about, what God is wanting to do. So uh, I think I want, I want Isaac, I want you to know God wants you to be a crackpot Christian. I think that's really the takeaway here. <laughs> and you are well on your way, well, well on your way. But this, this idea here of, of to chip away allows that light to, to come out more, and thereby lighting up the rest of the room for the rest of us in better ways. So that's what I think Paul has in mind here as he continues on into verse 8. He says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. I I love these two verses. Four couplets. This, but not that. This, but not that. The the, the power and the significance, really, of, of these two verses is all in one little word. All in that one little word, but, right? Have you ever noticed the power of the word but? How, how, how it's like a, it's a hinge, right? You're going one way, and then you say the word but, and everything flips. For example, have, have you met Chuck yet? Oh, Chuck is incredible. He's a wonderful man of God, and, and he loves his wife, and he loves his family. He's a good man, but. He's a, he's a bit annoying from time to time. Can I get an amen, right? <laughs> What do I really believe about Chuck now? <laughs> right? It's amazing about that word, but, how everything hinges, everything flips, everything changes on. You're going one way, and then suddenly 180 degrees. That's the idea here. But, but please understand, this, this is not just any but. This is God's but. And, and Adam, I have a confession to make. I like God's but. <laughs> I cannot lie. You brothers cannot deny. <laughs> Please understand, and I, and I mean this in all sincerity, God's butt is massive. <laughs> it really is. And it is a massive and powerful butt. And that is good news for you and I, because when you see it, it is life changing. <laughs> I'm making all these jokes on purpose, because I want you to remember this. I don't want you to ever forget how good and how big and powerful God's butt is, right? Because because we're going to see the significance of this. Now, before we get into these four couplets, there's there's a massive significance, I think, in these two verses and the three to follow from it. What Paul's presenting is not a sugar-coated message. It's not one that is preaching prosperity. It's not one that says, come to Jesus, and all your problems will go away. And as long as you're walking in the will of God, everything will be smooth, and everything will be good. It's far from that, far from that. That it is OK, and it is normal to go through difficult times. And, and your father has not abandoned you. See, he's not pretending that God is in any way unconnected or disconnected from what's happening. It's not like God is over there in, in the corner. He's like, I don't know. I mean, fallen world and all. 
I, I, I don't know. I, good luck. No, no. God is involved. He is present. He is engaged. And he is working in all this. And so what we're going to see in these four couplets is I think we'll find God's promise. God's promise is that he's very much present in the struggle, accomplishing his purpose, a purpose that is far greater, far better than anything you and I could ever want for ourselves. That's the promise. So let's look at these four couplets. The first one being afflicted, but not crushed. The, the word meaning here of afflicted is, is to feel this pressure. And, and it talks about pressure in all ways, in all things, from all sides. Have you ever kind of experienced that, where, where everywhere you turn in your world, everywhere you turn in your life, there just seems to be more pressure? Maybe it's pressure at home, pressure at work or at school, pressure with finances, pressure with, with health issues. Everywhere you turn, there just seems to be another problem, and it's just bearing down on you. And, and almost like the screws are just being tightened, and, and the pressure's growing and growing and growing. And what's God's promise in all this? It's not that the pressure will go, but in, in the pressure, you will have the perseverance, the resilience, because you won't be crushed. It won't end you. So again, think about that clay pot with all that pressure put on it. It feels like it's going to be just crushed into to little shards and be completely useless and be no good. And God says that won't happen. And the reason it won't happen is because the light, Jesus, is inside of you. That's a good word. Joanne, the, the pressure you're facing, Christ in you is enough. Christ in you is sufficient. And, and the pressure has increased and is increasing. But he's greater than it. He's stronger than it. And that's a good word. That gives us hope. That gives us a promise that in all things, Christ is sufficient. His grace, his power is more than enough that whatever I'm facing. The next couplet is perplexed but not despairing. If you don't know what perplexed means, that's what it means. <laughs> it means to be confused, to, to, to be doubting. Or I like this translation, to be at wit's end. Can anyone ever relate to being in such a, a state, right, where you're just at a total loss mentally, maybe even embarrassed, feeling stuck? That's what he's talking about here. And so maybe you've been dealing with something for a long time. You've been, you've been praying and you've been seeking God. God, give me an answer. God, change this situation. Change my heart. Do something. And you've been praying and praying and praying, and there just seems to be no resolve, seems to be no answer. What's, what's the great fear that can happen at this point? Is that you become so discouraged and, and so doubting in your faith that you begin to, to feel like there's no hope and that your faith even begins to stumble. And so God's promise is you will not be despairing, that there's always hope. And I think the hope for you and I is that God is always at work, always at work redeeming for our good what we're experiencing. That's Romans 8, 28 and 29. That God uses all things, not just the good things, not the easy things, not the spiritual things, but all things, the good, the bad, and the stuff that gives us ugly cries. He's using all things for our good, for our benefit, that we might be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. The, the struggle is when we just don't quite see the change right away. But there's a great illustration, I think, that God's given us in nature. Uh, you, you take a Chinese bamboo uh, seed and you plant it in the ground, and every day you water it and you look after it, for five years, you'll see nothing. It will look like just, just a barren patch of ground. And then after five years, a little sprout will begin to finally break through the ground. And six weeks later, that little sprout will be 90 feet tall. Now, you'd be mistaken to say that that plant grew 90 feet in six weeks. It took five years and six weeks for that plant to grow 90 feet. It's just that we didn't see what was happening in those first five years. It seemed that nothing was happening, and yet those five years were preparing it for those six weeks of growth. And so sometimes in our lives, you're in that five-year period where you just don't see what God's doing. You might even be thinking that I, you know, five years, that was 10 years ago. And that's true. 
I mean, that's, that's what David went through. It's what Abraham went through for 25 years, waiting for God's promise to finally come to fruition. But when it happens, you'll see it. But it's not that God was dormant. It wasn't God was, was asleep at the wheel. He was working, and he is working right now, which can lead us, I think, to the next couplet, which is persecuted <clears throat> but not forsaken. The meaning of persecuted is to be attacked, to, to literally be chased down by an enemy. Maybe this happens when people make accusations against you and your character. Or people, those who are your closest to, those who you've trusted, they may begin to gossip about you to others and, and share lies and, and begin to question your motives and question your characters in order to sow division and turn others against you. And so you see this persecution. And, and the danger in that moment is you'd start to feel alone that you're being picked on and being attacked. And so what's God's promise? It says you will not be forsaken. You will not be forgotten or abandoned. I will will be with you always, Jesus says. I'll never abandon you. I'll always stand beside you. And you'll never be alone. Never alone. Nikki, that's that's a song title I think you should think about. Just saying. Well, that brings us now to the fourth couplet, struck down or knocked out, but not destroyed. The the image here of being struck down is is like a boxer, like you would expect, where where you've just taken so many punches to the head, you've been flattened on your back. Knocked down. Maybe maybe it's something in your life where you feel like you failed, and you just don't know if there's any hope, any redemption. Maybe you've blown it in your marriage. Maybe you've blown it financially. Maybe you've blown it with some kind of sin in your past. And maybe it's not that past. Maybe it's in your present. And you just feel like, I can never recover from this. Maybe you even feel like God can't forgive you. But God's promise is that though you are knocked down, you are not destroyed. You are not knocked out. That God is able to make you stand, as it says in Jude. He's able to redeem anything. Think about it. If the God of the universe could redeem Calvary, the greatest sin, the greatest injustice, the the greatest darkness this world has ever seen, if God could redeem Calvary, can he not redeem you? Can he not redeem your sin and your failure? You bet he can. And so nothing that you've faced, nothing that we've we've gone through is the end of the story because the fight's not over. And so we get back up. Again, like we said, like Rocky, we get back up and we keep trusting Jesus. So we're we're pressured, we're afflicted, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not despairing. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're knocked down, but not destroyed. So what's our response in these moments? Well, verse 10, Paul goes on. He says, always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that our life, so the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Do you see what he's doing? He's gone back to we preach Jesus. That's what it's about. And, and I, I want to, again, I want to stress the importance of that. I was, uh, I was listening to... Um, to an, a, a teacher, and in, in, in he's, he's one of the many teachers that unfortunately has is, is struggled in his ministry, and he's sort of lost it because of his approach to ministry. And, and he made the statement, he says, I, I just want two things for the rest of my life. I, I want to love my family, and I want to teach the Bible. And the first one was good, and the second one was not. And please understand, like, I'm not against the Bible. We're, we're going through the scriptures right now, and we're, we're teaching from the scriptures. And I, I love the scriptures, and that's what we're going to do each and every week. We're going to teach the scriptures. But we don't teach the Bible. We preach Jesus. And that was this man's mistake, is that he was so wrapped up in the, in the rules and what he was seeing, he was missing the person. As Paul wrote in Timothy, there was an appearance of godliness, but there's no power in that godliness. So we don't teach the Bible. We don't don't teach you to be like Josh. We don't teach you to to follow this pattern, to live like someone else. We we don't try to, to teach you to be really motivated and buck up and try harder. No, no, no. We we teach Jesus. 
We, we preach Jesus and who he is and what he's done and who you are now in him. 1 Corinthians 1.18, one of my favorite verses, Paul writes this, for the word, the message, the teaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved. It's the power of God. Notice, notice the tense on saved. It's not past tense. It's not to those of us who have been saved. And yet, that's how we typically think about salvation, right? We think about it as when I was saved in the past. But he's talking about a present tense, that I am presently being saved. And I'm being saved by the power of God because it's found in the cross. And that's what we want to teach, Jesus Christ and him crucified. What has he accomplished on that cross? And so he goes on now, and he's expressing this idea. We're caring about our body and the dying of Jesus, what Jesus did on the cross, how, how he, yes, forgave our sins, but did much more, how he made us new creations and put his life inside of us, and has made us holy and righteous and new people, saints of God, no longer sinners. And then he goes on, and he says in, in this phrase here of Jesus manifested in our body. He says it in verse 10, and he says it again in verse 11. He's repeating himself. Why does someone repeat themselves? For emphasis, for importance. So, so this is like the divine clue that God's giving to you and I. He says, pay attention. Pay attention to what he's saying here. This idea here of Jesus manifested in our bodies. It's, it's Galatians 2.20, right? That I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ now lives in me. That's the significance here. Let me, let me illustrate it to you this way. Um, it's been a while since I've shared this illustration, but, but it's a good one. Uh, any golfers here? I, I don't get it. I don't understand. <laughs> I mean, how, how, like, so help me out there. Because here's my struggle. Every time I go to putt, I can't make it past the windmill. What am I doing wrong? <laughs> I'm clearly not a golfer, right? But, but I've... I like sports, and I just always have a sense of what's going on in the sports world. And, and every May is this, the big tournament, the tournament. If you're to win one golf tournament, you win this tournament. What is it? Down in Augusta, Georgia, the Masters. Because you know what you get. Richard, do you, do you know what you get when you win the Masters? A green sport coat. I know. I don't get it either. But it's a big deal. Here's the worst part of it. After one year, you don't get to take the coat home anymore. It has to stay at the club. If you want to wear your green sport coat that you won, by the way, you have to go visit the, the clubhouse. <laughs> I don't get it. But it's a big deal, right? Well, suppose, suppose I wanted a green sport coat. And I didn't want to go to Walmart and buy one. No, I want an authentic master's green sport coat. So I want to win this tournament. But I got a problem. What's my problem? I can't golf. I, can't golf. <laughs> I lack this little, little small thing called skill, ability, talent. I mean, it's overrated for some, right? I don't have it, right? Because every time I go up and if I were to golf, then, then there's this thing called a slice. You know what a slice is? where it hits like three parking lots over. That's my problem, right? I, I've wondered at times, do I just need to aim this way and get it to slice back? But I'm sure that the, the crowd would not appreciate that. So I'm not a golfer. But, but you know, Tiger Woods, he's a golfer. And he's won the Masters a lot. And so maybe, maybe I just need coaching. And who better to teach me to win the Masters than someone who's won it multiple times? So imagine I got lots of money. I got more money than I know what to do with, right? I'm the, one of the richest people in the world. And, and so I hire Tiger Woods to now teach and train me how to play, play the game of golf. After two years, I mean, I follow him around everywhere. We talk golf. We live, breathe, eat, sleep golf. After two years, I know as much about golf as he does. And I say to Tiger, Tiger, am I ready to win the Masters? And what does he say? Not a chance. Not a chance. I say, what, Tiger, you don't understand. I know, I know what you know. I mean, when you say the one word, I know what that means now, right? So, so I know golf. I, I know it. What am I missing, Tiger? And what does he say? Skill, talent. Ross, I don't know how to break. I've been trying to tell you for two years. It ain't going to work because you just don't got it, kid. 
well, I'm devastated. I'm heartbroken over this, this, this reality, this truth that I'm never going to have my green sport coat. And Tiger can see the dejection. He sees the, the sadness and, the, <clears throat> and the, the grief in my eyes. And he says, well, there is there's one way. What we can do is, is we can unzip you, and I can step inside of you with all of my talents and all of my abilities. Now, if you didn't realize that this is a make-believe story, when I said I was rich, that's where we left reality, OK? So we haven't been in reality for a long time, right? So, but he says there's a, there's a zipper. And he says it runs from the top of your head down the back of your left leg, and I can unzip you and step inside of you. And so sure enough, he, he finds it. It was somewhere in behind the man bun. That's why I never saw it. That's why, Craig. But, but he unzips me, and now, now Tiger Woods, in all of his ability, steps into me. And now in that moment, I have his power. I have his strength. And so I walk up to that first tee, that first hole. And you can almost hear Jim Nance, the announcer, saying, well, we have this new golfer, amateur Ross Gilbert. Never heard of him coming from Canada. We're going to see what he can do. And I say, OK, Tiger. We're going to trust you on this whole one. What should we do? He says, I would do the one wood. I know what that is. So I grab the club. But I say, Tiger, I'm going to trust you, not me, because I don't have the ability, right? You do. He says, that's right. And so trusting Tiger, I hit it and actually go straight. Now, was it me or Tiger? The answer was yes. <laughs> right? It was me trusting Tiger Woods in me. And he hit the shot. In fact, Jim Nance, the announcer, might say, you know, his swing reminds me of a Tiger Woods. Because it was. That's the gospel, guys. That's what Paul's talking about here. Jesus manifested in you and I, in our bodies, in our mortal flesh. It's not me trying to be like Jesus. It's not me trying to imitate Jesus. Because that's the lie in the garden, right? That you can do something to be like God. No, don't, tr don't try that. Let God be God in you. Let Christ be Christ in you. Let him be manifested in and through you. And that's what's so beautiful is when I'm facing these trials, Christ in me is sufficient. And so he says it's always and constantly, always and constantly that I'm going to be facing these trials, which means that it's not about finding utopia in this world. This world will never offer up utopia. It will never offer up this freedom that we're looking for. They're always and constantly going to face these, these trials, face these pressures, these persecutions, these being uh, struck down and, 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 uh, and attacked and so forth. And God's not punishing me in any of that. No, he's not against me in any of that. I'm not out of his will. Instead, he's using those things. He's using those trials so that the life of Jesus can be contrasted in this world. Think about it. Again, those testimonies that we love so much. If, if someone gets up and they share their testimony, and you know that they've got the, the perfect home, right? Nice big home, and they got a great job and a wonderful retirement package, and they got you know three cars, even though there's only two drivers, and they got that 2.2 kids. Like they got everything, just just what the world would preach, and they seem to be happy and content. Is anyone surprised by it? In fact, what do they say? Well, you know, if I had 2.2 kids, I'd be happy too, right? So they, they credit to the circumstances. But if you take someone else now and they've got a really bad job and their house is falling apart and roof is leaking and, and they've got three cars, but, you know, two of them are on blocks. And yet there's contentment and there's joy in their hearts. You say, okay, what do they got? Because by all rights, they shouldn't be content. Well, let me tell you about Jesus. The light shows up best in darkness so that God would be glorified. And so we can embrace this always and constantly in these struggles that we're going through so that God would be glorified. So he summarizes it in verse 12. Verse 12 is a great summary statement. He says, so death works in us so that life works in you. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say death works in me, in us, so that the life of God works in us. You would expect that. That would make sense based on the logic and what he's saying. But he says death works in us, these trials, these difficulties I'm facing, so that you would benefit from it. But the larger context all makes sense again, because he says I'm a bond slave to you, Corinthians. I'm here to love you and to serve you. 
He said it's similar to the Philippians, right? For me to die is gain, but to live is Christ. And I'm torn between the two. But for me to stay on and to live is to benefit you because you're going to experience Christ in me. So he says, I will embrace the always and constantly of facing trials and difficulties and persecutions, knowing that those, those pressures, those difficulties, is squeezing the life of Jesus out of me to encourage you, to love you, and to bless you. He's back to this idea of being a, bron- a bond slave. I- imagine a world where we adopt that attitude where we adopt that mindset where I'm more interested in what I can offer to other people than what I can get for myself, that I abandon this this me first mentality and I can offer love to other people. I think that would change the choices we make, would change the goals that we chase after and the dreams we have because we'd be more interested in seeing God glorified through us in other people. I want to highlight one last passage before we close. It's, uh, it's Philippians 2, 1 to 13. We're not going to read it here this morning. I want to encourage you, though, sometime this week, pull out your Bible. It might be dusty for some of you, and that's OK. But pull out your Bible and open up to this passage, Philippians 2, 1 to 13, and read it. And when you're done reading it, I want you to then ponder it. Think about what that passage is saying, what, it, what it's saying to you. And then maybe even then write out your thoughts, kind of collect some of those thoughts and organize some of those thoughts as to what God's saying to you so that the word of God can begin to impact your heart. But I want to summarize a little bit of what this passage is saying. He begins off and says, if there's there's anything encouraging, anything hopeful, anything good, anything praiseworthy, may may you dwell on those things in order to love one another, and maintain the unity that you already have in Jesus Christ. He says, so don't operate in a selfish manner. Don't look out for only your comfort, only your needs, but rather, what do others need? Be willing to sacrifice. Be willing to be a bond slave, even if it costs you something. Because that was the attitude Jesus had. That that although he was God, is God, always will be God, He let go of that. He let go of living like God. And he gave up his rights, and he emptied himself, and he humbled himself, and was obedient to the point of death on the cross. He was a bond slave to you and I in that sense. And therefore, God highly exalted him, raised him up above all the other names, the names to come. And therefore, you and I are to work out our salvation in a similar manner. Working it out, meaning just begin to let it happen. Let, it, let this growth, that this maturity of loving others begin to take place. For God is in you both to will and to do according to his goodwill, according to his pleasure. In, in that illustration with Tiger Woods, it's Tiger Woods is in me both to pick the shot, pick the club, and then to make the shot through me. And that's what we have. We have Jesus is in us now to show us, how do I love Norman Sherrill? And then when he gives me the idea, I actually trust him to pull it off. And now Christ in me is loving Norman Cheryl, and God is glorified through me in them. And then they get to love Kim and Adam. And Kim and Adam, well, Kim, maybe Adam, can love Josh and Sarah. And this, this thing can begin to spread like a wildfire. And so there's no better place for it to start than at home with our own family, and in our church, and our friends. And if we can just begin to do that, I think it could begin to impact this world. And the world will see Christ in you, because that's what we're preaching. That in God's big butt. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the reality that we're not abandoned. We're not crushed. We're not forsaken. We're not struck down. That's not the end of the story. Far from it. And although this may be always and constantly happening to us, We can always and constantly be reminded of the truth, the truth of the gospel, of who you are, of what you've done, of what you've accomplished, who you've made us, how you've changed us, and who you are in us today. And as we are reminded and we're focused on that, that life of Jesus can now flow through us. May we hold on to that beautiful truth this week, just this day even. In your name we pray. 
Amen.